please feel free to help yourselves to tea at the back. Welcome to the Women's Center with the Center for Women's Studies and Education. I'm Jamie. I'm the coordinator here. This is one of the final events in our series in honor of Roxanne Lane. We do have two That's more coming up, one next week on decolonizing yoga and one the first week of April on racial hierarchies in nursing communities in Canada. Um, so I encourage you to come to all of those, and I want to welcome Pam Patterson and Eva Karpinski. Pam is one of our associate scholars here at the Centre. She's the director of WIA Projects, which is an arts group that spawned from the CWSC back in 2005, slash 2008-ish. And Eva is associated with the CWSC in that she's done a lot of events with us, and she can tell you a little bit more about her background. Um, and Eva and I have worked together on various projects, yes. and we'll continue to do so. Here, Eva's name quite Hopefully. a bit. No. Um, our other two presenters are not here today, and Pam's going to speak about that briefly. Yeah. And fill yeah. Us in. Thanks. Otherwise, welcome Pam and Eva. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> thank you for coming. Yay, thanks, thanks for, for coming. coming. Yes, do thank you. Um, I just want to read an email that, we re that I received this morning from um, Saida and uh, Manal, um, and she just says, hello, this is directed to, to Eva, myself, and to Jamie. There is a very tragic and sudden development that I have to tell you about urgently. I'm extremely sorry, but I and Manal will not be able to come and present today as we need to rush to Oakville for a funeral and prayer service ceremony. The young daughter of my very close childhood friend was killed in a terrorist attack suicide bomb blast yesterday in Pakistan and there's going to be a service for her here that we have to attend. Family and friends are devastated and are in need of our urgent support at this time. We need to rush to be with them um, and will not be able to be intact in time for the CWSE presentation. We're extremely sorry for this unexpected development, but humbly hope that the presentation will go through with Pam and Eva. We would like to sincerely convey our apologies to the people who may have come to hear us We've been looking forward to this, and this is a very sad development. Again, please accept our deepest apology. Sincerely, Saida and Manal. Um, I wrote them back, and I said, <laughs> I said that we would um, that we would begin today, if if people are comfortable with that, with just a minute of silence, in prayer and solidarity. Um, this is the young woman, uh, Fiza Malik, who was uh, who was killed. This would have been yesterday. So if we could just take a moment. Um, Thank you. It's interesting how a minute can seem like a lifetime, and yet in that minute, um, a 25-year-old woman was killed. Let us begin. In the night, a child is screaming. Cancer is in my head for life. What path am I being asked to step away from on behalf of my life? Crossing cancer's space, it's a different time zone, a different place, a long breathing space in which the mind gathers its strength and takes stock of its courage. Listen, I have not lost my power. I have not forgotten who I am. Once my gods were intimates. Once I made gestures of pure exuberance. Now my hands invent another body for my body. As the world reduces to a small, brilliant space where every thought and movement is vital to my salvation, let me suddenly have a center. Let me leave a silhouette on the world. Let me stand composed before a million universes. Patterson, 2006. Cellular Resistance, A Body Without Organs was a performance work that I developed as an artist-in-residence for FADO um, here in Toronto. 
in 2008. So the cancer text that I've just read embodied a personal expression of my experience of living with breast cancer. It was the place I occupied at the time. Stephanie Springay, who's a faculty member here at OISE, uh, refers to this word splace as metonomic, in which place as both idea and text resonates with space. Each word has a similar and slightly different meaning from the other, and when referenced together, they create a delicious frisson. It opens me to mutability, to being unfixed in flux, where I can move between the conventional space of being diseased and dying and the place of being cancer survivor. Both narratives, for me, are intensely problematic. If one does not die, does then one have, I wonder, stages of cancer recovery or is indicated for one's impending death? Living in a no-woman zone after acute cancer treatment is like being given a reprieve in a holding cell. While the preferred cancer euphemism is survivor, it's an uncomfortable place. If I've survived, then from and for what? What are the alternatives to death? Is this binary the only option? So my work has been examining this phenomenon I call the post-cancer distress disorder through cultural productions, performances, visual images, and evocative academic texts. So my reasoning is that if I activate this holding place in and through performatives that I and perhaps my witnesses will somehow be released from this confining construction. Into what? I don't know. Perhaps the intention is to find a momentum to at the very least locate us in a splice of becoming. Being both material and disembodied, perhaps mobile and pain-free, located as in subjective matrices where we constructively play our histories. So it's that sort of shift between both being embodied and disembodied um, and trying to play in the place where you can be both simultaneously. My flushed bodies is not without its scars. Breast cancer, in my case, continues to leave its residues. The scar of the incised and removed breast, the weight gain, the chronic insidious muscle pains and mobility issues, the exhaustion and financial stress. I'm a woman with painful disabilities living with cancer challenges. Grappling with the means to survive, to thrive, to engage, to act, it's what drives me to explicate complexify and attempt to potentially escape from this problematic place. Donna Haraway enacts a new reading practice that takes the discursively constructed material body as a starting point and narrates a reconstructed fiction of identity. She writes that only bodies that stand a chance in postmodern culture are cyborg bodies constructed by communication, networks, and other hybrid discourses. Cyber borgies are neither borgies are neither wholly technological or completely organic. They're a matter of fiction and a matter of lived experience. The cyborg challenges feminism to search for ways to study the body as it is once both a cultural construction and a material fact of human life. If the female body can be theoretically construction, constructed as an arrangement of text, silences, laws, and lines of force, it can then be radically articulated among writing practices, relations of power, cultural stagings, material bodies, and socially constructed perceptions. That's cited in Balsamo. Transform transfeminism, a panorama of knowledges and vectors of emergence, has established discourses that valorize cyborgian sensibilities and transverse thinking. Emergence is key to this post cyber feminist age of transfeminisms. This speaks to a cyber consciousness, a cyborg becoming as a way of describing an unfixed space, not a hybrid place so much as a perceptual place of becoming. It opens up the possibilities of becoming anew as a performative that strains the limits of a holding cell. So my interest is, because I work as a performance artist, I actually teach at OCAD University and the new Life Studies program. So I become really interested in that sort of relationship between the body, the body um, as object, and then the body with, in relationship to ground or context. And what happens as we move and shift between those? You know, rather than denying the objectified body, what happens if we confront it and put it into play? 
So performative cues for breast cancer resistance as presentation gives recognition to a performative knowledge that is original, mutable, and transformative. This presentation is meant to be nonlinear and associative. As a metaphoric enterprise, and what's interesting, we were just talking about metaphor and talking about the difference between Sontag and how Sontag rejects the metaphor. So it's, then that becomes an interesting discussion, which I'm taking up in class, actually, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's aesthetic, multilayered, and multiperspectival, giving value to the pleasures of use and form. It provides a space to playfully engage cyborgian sensibilities. So I'm asking you to perceive this presentation as multilayered and performative. Invite yourself to allow an interplay among various texts and see these texts as metaphoric. Recognize them as fitting to represent some of the complex stagings in place for a woman living with cancer. Nana was left alone, her face upturned in the light of the candle. What lay on the pillow was a charnel house, a heap of pus and blood, a shovelful of putrid flesh. The pustules had invaded the whole face so that one pock touched the next. Withered and sunken, they'd taken on the color of mud, and on that shapeless pulp in which the features had ceased to be discernible, they already looked like mold from the grave. One eye, the left eye, had completely foundered in the bubbling purulence, and the other, which remained open, looked like a dark, decaying hole. The nose was still separating. A large, reddish crust starting on one of the cheeks was invading the mouth, twisting it into a terrible grin. And around the grotesque mask of death, the hair, the beautiful hair, still blazed like sunlight and flowed in a stream of gold. Venus was decomposing. It was as if the poison she'd picked up in the gutters from the carcasses left there by the roadside that ferment with which she had poisoned a whole people had now risen to her face and rotted it. Emile Zola, page 470. So if you're not familiar, Emile Zola wrote between 1871 and 1893 a 20-volume saga tracing madness and disease through the generations of a family. So in Nana, he specifically located society's ill in the body of a Parisian prostitute, Nana. He wrote, Witness a whole society hurling itself at a cunt. She, as cunt, is a force of nature, a ferment of destruction, which destroys everything as she approaches, turning it to ash. So I took this text from Emile Zola's Nana as one enactment for research. As an image, um, it's quite evocative <laughs> and has informed many of my works around cancer. So it echoed for me, as well as my mother's horror, of her imagined deterioration through death by cancer. On January 7, 1880, Emile Zola finished his novel, Nana. On December 11, 2001, my mother died of lung cancer. These events were not entirely unrelated. When I take a breath, I reenact this embedded relationship. So in a performance action I made at the edge of Lake Ontario in May 2002, I gasped and grasped for breath, meeting the elements, acknowledging their power and ability to reclaim and destroy. I was in both the rehearsing and the performing, cold, wet, blown to the edge of the water and deafened by the roar of the waves, wind and rain pounding and sweeping around me. Believe it or not, this was in March. Well, it was a warmer year. <laughs> My strategy was to ritualize both the ending of breath and the beginning of another. In this case, the end of my breath, end of breath was my mother's, the taking of new breath, mine. Watching my mother's death was very much the witnessing of breath ending. Dying of lung cancer, she literally choked to death. And at the end, she let go. Are we really conscious of our own breathing? Are we really aware of how we choose to live, how we take that breath? I wanted to bury my mother, acknowledge the ending of her breath, and to gasp as an infant at birth for my own. I wanted to reclaim my choice to live, to rage, to reach, to throw, to be alive and active, battling the wind, waves, and cold. So I took my own breath. Seven months after this action, my cousin was diagnosed with breast cancer. Twelve months later, I too was diagnosed. Both of us had seen our grandmother die of cancer, me, my mother, and of course her aunt, and now we embodied in our breasts dis-ease. We attempt, and still do attempt, each in our own way to throw it, whatever we find it to be, off. 
Breast, boobs, rack, shelf, bosom, cookies, tits, melons, apples, fried eggs, breast. Mastectomy, lumpectomy, mammogram, ultrasound, needle aspiration, core biopsy, infiltrating lobular carcinoma, infiltrating ductal carcinoma, lymphedema, radiotherapy, lobular neoplasia, metastases, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, carcinoma in situ, plasma viscosity, fibrogenogen, auxiliary node dissection, which thank God they don't do anymore. They don't do dissection? Not auxiliary. Now they're oh. doing sentinel. Oh, yeah, sentinel. we got auxiliary. Mitotic grade receptor status, Bloom Richardson scale, nuclear grade tubular formation, mitotic count, tumor necrosis, breast cancer. It's interesting how one learns a new and rather foreign vocabulary when one leaves the known world of conventional to society to join the breast cancer consortium. It's challenging enough to have to grapple with derogatory words hurled at, it, words hurled at us that refer to our breasts as everything from fruit to objects. But when they, we, become medicalized, this escalates. It takes a lifetime to explore the meanings for breast, but we're given but a few days to learn the language of breast cancer in order to make decisions that will affect our bodies, our appearance, and <coughs> breath. A dessert, the breast cancer bomb. This was actually written uh, and then, then formed, performed for La Centrale Gallery in Montreal. So we were actually asked to create actions, which then went into a, a publication. And then performance artists in Montreal actually did these actions. So um, I wasn't there, but I saw images that were done with this. This dessert requires specific ingredients, which while you may not have at hand, friends or family may. As one passionate one, no breasted or partially breasted woman living with breast cancer, carefully measure and mix these ingredients. Frustration in waiting for doctor's appointments, tests, test results, treatment, stress from cancer diagnosis and negotiating the medical system, physical and emotional pain from surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, thousands of dollars spent on drugs not covered by your insurance company, your wig, hat, or hair remnants, your removed breasts or portions and nodes not used by research, your two biopsies, mammograms, especially the indeterminate ones, ultrasounds, MRIs, CAT scans, bone scans, your information and treatment protocols binder. Do you still have yours? I do. Yeah. <laughs> Frustration having only white, hetero, upper middle class, symmetrical, prosthetic, or reconstructed, thin, urban, chic women as models for survival. Feel free to add your own variations. Mix and mass into mix and form into a solid mass. Wrap this mass in the millions spent on cancer research and cancer pharmaceuticals. Inject with one of the following AC plus Taxol, Tamoxifen, CEF, CMF. Bake in radiation. The resultant mass may be rather difficult to swallow. At present, only those who are life members of a select group may make and eat this dish, but it could now be served in many public forums. Roll it on your next walk to promote cancer prevention. Deliver it to your MP, MPP, and city councillor when they next decide to renege on their pesticide ban. It should be a just dessert at the board meeting of any major company known to produce carcinogens. Dishing out the breast cancer bomb can invigorate those who until now have been its only consumer. So drop it off, give it away. You don't need to swallow it alone. Baldness is a scar. I want my scar. I want to be able to put my hands on it and have the wind touch it, to rub comfrey salve into it and to feel the rises and hollows of my skull without hair scratching and skidding under my fingertips. I don't want a shop to cover my scar, which will at any rate fade and heal, just as the one on my chest and under my arm are doing. I do not want to pass. I do not want to go into gently back into the world of people who are afraid of looking into the eyes of someone whose chances of dying in the near future are better than theirs by a long shot, or so they need to believe. This is adapted from Catherine Lord, The Summer of Her Baldness. I could at this point summarize my results or lay out my arguments to clarify and release you as witness from this awkward staging, but I choose not to. In attending to shifts among the fictional and actual body, the body politic and the body as reconstructed, a cyber splice for breast cancer reconsideration has been opened. I ask that you be complicit in my performing this enactment. In closing, I ask that we fearlessly take up cultural practices whereby we can become inextricably engaged in, though perhaps not necessarily freed from or outside of the conditions, context, and positionality of our lives and living. 
We may need to accept that we won't escape the holding cell of the breast cancer survivor, but we can recontextualize it, stress it, and complexify it. It's a beginning. So I was going to mention, which is this final image, um, a lot of the newer work that I've been doing. I actually just came back Sunday night um, from the Dominican Republic where I was performing for a week there. So I've been really interested now in looking at the um, sort of the damage, the, the older, the aging, the disabled, the re surgically reconstructed body within public space. Um, and so this was an image from a piece that I did um, recently, which was shown in Turin, Italy last year, called Red Square, and the piece that I just performed in the Dominican Republic for, on Thursday um, was called Emigrante Desplazado, and looking at the notion of sort of displaced migrant. So I'm moving forward now into, into placing things more in a political context. So it's sort of apropos of this that, um, that that's what Eva will be doing for us. So um, would it be best um, to present both of us and then open it up for discussion? Have a conversation together. Okay, so I'll okay. pass it over Thank you to so Eva. Much. And so I'm just going to open up. this Before up. Before you do, this is just like some background images that I've brought in, not really integrated, as I said, into my talk. But um, I just want to say how amazed I'm, I am when you, you know, I've seen you in a few talks already, how you managed to pull together, how powerfully you managed to pull together uh, intimate personal emotions and uh, strong public affects around breast cancer mm. as well as politics. So uh, I've recently moved towards working with affects and politics oh, of great. breast yeah, cancer. Yeah, yeah. And that work with breast cancer documentaries is actually part of what I've been trying to you yes, know, develop. Yeah. So it's part of a larger project um, focusing as a site, as an archive, um, on Canadian breast cancer documentaries. And you would be surprised how rich this archive actually is. <laughs> so, and that might be due partly to, you know, very, very, a very lucky coincidence of funding and some traditions and, and festivals and, you know, the National Film Board in Canada. Um, but it has been a lot to choose from, Were really. doing some work on Jerry Rogers? Yes. Yeah. yeah but I, I'm met her, I, I met her. Yes. In the, yeah, in the I met her. Yeah. I do. So I briefly Claire, tell I'll you. I'll just, do you want to? Okay. So, uh, I mean, you, you're probably aware, uh, having read Maren Clowiter and, and other breast cancer theorists, uh, there's been this shift uh, from the robust environmental and women's health movements in the 1980s, 1990s um, to the subsequent neoliberal uh, reprivatization of uh, the breast cancer experience. Um, and it's in more recently, it's taken the form of uh, the consumption of commercially produced illness memoirs. Um, and mass participation in corporate sponsored cultures of fundraising. Right? Mm. And I thought it was very, it, it's easier to look at, and Martin Kravitter also mapped out um, those movements back in the 90s in a way that I still find very useful. And you may remember, they call them cultures of action. In other words, focusing on types of activism that was possible around breast cancer at that time. And she modeled those cultures of action on three um, uh, forms of activism in the Bay Area in San Francisco in the early 1990s. And they were, they were the common um, race for the cure, the women and cancer walk, and the toxic tour of the cancer industry. So they roughly sort of like corresponded to what at the time um, could be aligned with liberal uh, feminist activism, multicultural in the US context activism, and um, radical feminism mm -hmm. of the toxic um, tour. Uh, now this typology has actually proved quite useful to me when I was looking at uh, breast cancer documentaries and that's similar to how I have um, mapped them out. Where uh, the two that I'm going to talk about today, Exposure and Pink Ribbons, they actually represent um, the first type, the, the uh, I mean it's the combination, there's never any pure type. But what they represent is perhaps I should say um, more top-down approach towards um, looking at the, at, the, at the breast cancer um, scene and, and kinds of possible activism. But using some affect theories, I've been increasingly interested in how we can talk about what kind of language we can develop um, around breast cancer activism since, you know, as I said, corporate sponsored fundraising also counts as 
activism now. So we need a different kind of language now. I mean, this old mm. language of activism is no longer um, sufficient, right? And I've been um, leaning back onto some affect theories, um, and, and what I found useful was, for instance, Lauren Berlant's concept of intimate publics. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, which intimate publics captures the neoliberal paradox um, of the increased production um, of public visibility um, of people's intimate experiences, including, of course, the experience of breast cancer, while at the same time, uh, this public visibility of intimacy is accompanied by the shrinking public sphere of um, civic involvement and dissent. Mm -hmm. So we all sort of like moving into um, sharing similar structures of feeling around breast cancer, and these have been sort of like um, under the banner of um, you know, pink ribbons and uh, running for the cure and fundraising for the cure, of course. So I extend Berlin's idea a little bit uh, to focus on intimate cancer publics, um, how they are performed in that one specific site that I'm examining that is breast cancer documentary. And uh, what the space of public, uh, intimate publics, is the space where personal intensities of illness resonate powerfully with larger fields, and that's what, what affect theories allow you to, to realize, where personal intensities of illness um, can be publicly performed as narratives and images, right? Um, and where dominant discourses of, uh, in, uh, of the body and biomedical institutions, um, such as healthcare, pharmaceutical research, and corporate fundraising, they resound with intimate force. What it means is that they literally impact our intimate experience of mm -hmm. breast cancer. Um, so what I was hoping to be able to understand through this project was um, whether there's any possibility of uh, raising counter publics to those intimate, mm -hmm. to those neoliberal um, intimate uh, publics. And um, whatever publics and counter publics can be raised at any given moment, um, is intimately linked to the current regimes of biopower, and that's another concept from affect theories. Biopower is the power that governs lives. It's a Foucauldian term taken from Michel Foucault, of course, right? So it's power uh, that governs the, the power that governs the lives, bodies, and minds of individual subjects, but also entire populations. So our experience of breast cancer is usually, I mean, it can be seen through those two different uh, types of biopower, right? I mean that very intimate individual, um, and uh, what Foucault calls, um, um, you know, anatomopolitics, right, of mm. individual bodies, and um, the biopolitics of populations that is embodied through all those institutions, what uh, uh, Pam referred to as the BC consortium, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, <clears throat> So in order to explore those possibilities of rallying different publics and counter-publics around breast cancer, um, I look at what I call onco-filmographics. Onco-filmographics is my, my, con my term for, for those documentaries. And I also divide them into three categories based on uh, Claviter. But I, today I just want to look at, those, at, at that category, uh, which includes, um, you know, um, Francine Zuckerman's exposure. Uh, environmental links to breast cancer, and that's the documentary made in 1999 that has been screened here, actually. We, and the other one is Lea Poole, Pink Ribbons, Inc., and that's from 2011, and you may have seen it, you may be familiar mm -hmm. with it. Uh, for me, they exemplify uh, those interventionist forms of um, environmental um, uh, and ethical-political critique of biopower um, and... Um, corporatism, right, in, in breast cancer cultures. And through, I mean, looking at those documentaries and the other ones that I'm also working on, uh, you can recognize those linkages, which are not so immediately obvious, you know, when we read people's uh, commercially uh, produced cancer memoirs, for instance. Mm -hmm. Those intimate linkages among, um, you know, cancer bodies and their caregivers, their families, but also medical technologies, what you talk about as those cyber, cyborg mm -hmm. becomings, mm -hmm. right? Um, so medical technologies, but knowledge practices as well, legal frameworks that, that exist in our healthcare, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, medical pro protocols, it's, it, despite all the talk about individualist uh, healthcare, in fact, 
Canadian, the Canadian healthcare operates through a very limited number of medical protocols that are applied to people who are diagnosed, right? So all those healthcare institutions, industries, also local and global economies, right? Media stories, public ethics, all those linkages exist there and you can try to, mm -hmm. you know, map them out by looking at some of those uh, documentaries. So quickly to the, to the I want to, and what I want to talk about today is um, to question the efficacy of those documentaries, as much as I'm happy that they are, that they exist, that people can watch them. Um, I am concerned about the context of their consumption, the context of their uh, production as well, uh, and, you know, whether they can be um, really a form of rallying of counter publics. So more about that later. So these two documentaries, Exposure and Pink Ribbons, um, share an urgent political agenda, um, and they want to, uh, you know, denounce certain practices. Each of them is, is what sometimes is called the cinema of denunciation, right? Um, so what is the cinema of denunciation? It's politically engaged alternative documentary uh, that aims to unmask the truth that has been distorted or misrepresented in, uh, in mainstream media, in, in dominant uh, discourses. So directors, uh, Leah, Lea Poole and Francine Zuckerman return to the documentary tradition of Studio D um, that tried to bring feminist perspectives into um, uh, important social issues that they've covered through their documentary work. And as you can see, uh, uh, exposure honors the work of Rachel Carson. I, I apologize for the quality of those slides. Mm -hmm. And they just meant to be some background images focusing your attention. They're not integrated into my presentation, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But here you have Rachel C Carson. So exposure um, celebrates her and draws attention to the environment contaminated with toxic substances such as pesticides, radiation, uh, industrial chemicals uh, that act as carcinogens, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, film, the film connects the increased pollution of our earth, food, and water to military testing and the post-World War II growth of the chemical and pharmaceutical industries. And it makes a direct appeal to the viewers uh, to take action. Um, on the other hand, Pink Ribbons Inc. Uh, inquires into the intersection of corporate capitalism and intimacy uh, by taking aim at cause marketing. I hope you all know what cause marketing is. Cause marketing allows um, companies and corporations to increase profits by aligning themselves with um, breast cancer causes, right? So the film exposes the phenomenon of pink washing, okay, it's mm -hmm. a well known phenomenon, by pharmaceutical and cosmetic industries. Um, and such corporations that appear in pink ribbons are the uh, AstraZeneca which produces tamoxifen, but also sponsors Breast Cancer Month. Um, Avon, Revlon, Estee Lauder, um, they develop partnerships with breast cancer advocacy groups for fundraising. Now, what these relationships do, of course, they dilute the radical political impetus um, that used to be part of the breast cancer movements, this, this kind of like, you know, nostalgic look back into the 90s um, and the 80s. But they endorse running for the cure and shopping for the cure <laughs> as the most legitimate forms of breast cancer activism today, right? Um, and also the documentary um, shows how the sentimental politics of pink ribbon campaigns uh, deflects attention from research on prevention and issues of environmental justice and normalizes the neoliberal shift to philanthropy. And I wanted to give you a few um, facts here. So, okay, uh, the, the statistical data that we get in the documentary, uh, while millions are raised through running for the cure, only 15% of that goes to research on prevention and 5% goes to research on environment. So 80% goes to other things, mostly genetic research now. The mm -hmm. neo, and, and we know, of course, that genetic cancers are only about 10% of all cancers. So the neoliberal tendency to substitute public services with private fundraising through non-profit organizations is just one of the symptoms of the abdication of responsibility to citizens by our governments, right? Um, who, that should be regulating um, cancerogenic industries and healthcare mm -hmm. standards 
and also, you know, redistributing wealth so that, you know, more funds are given to preventative research. Um, so participation in corporate-led fundraising events through running provides individual and collective comfort but cannot rally critical counterpublics that would demand accountability for how the money is spent. And Poole's film, Pink Ribbons, Inc., assumes this catalyst role uh, in trying to provoke conversations around what we are doing with this money that we are raising. Where does this money go? So there have been a series of post-screening uh, debates in festival venues and on public radio, and I say a little bit more about that because I've participated in some of such public debates. Um, also, Pink Ribbons uh, alerts us to the globalization of um, the breast cancer movement um, that benefits corporate interests by producing a culture of risk around breast cancer in places where breast cancer is not a primary concern. Um, so, in order to build convincing arguments, both exposure and pink ribbons um, had to re rely on um, extensive research. And this is incredible what amount of research had to go into producing both documentaries. So it involved um, talks and interviews with many experts, scientists, environmentalists, activists, authors, fundraisers, corpor corporate leaders, and ordinary people such as women um, who have undergone breast cancer treatments, their families, caregivers, friends. Um, this research must have also comprised print and online materials, photographs, archives, newsreels, and arts. It's an incredible mm -hmm. amount of information. So the challenge for both filmmakers is how to present this abundance of material in such a way that it is not perceived as biased, self-serving, or overwhelming. Um, given the sheer volume of the accumulated knowledge and facts, there is a potential danger uh, of information overload mm -hmm. um, in investigative documentaries in general, in particular, um, you know, in exposure and pink ribbons. So they have certain ways of mitigating against information overkill. Um, so in order to tone down um, abstract intellectual ideas, they try to pace the rhythm of, a document, of the documentary in a certain way. Um, so there's special montage, there is music, graphics, or there is narration by attractive hosts. <laughs> um, and this is Olivia Newton-John, who is the narrator of Exposure. Um, I'll say more about her later. So um, in Exposure also, you, you see intertitles are used to segment the information into more digestible chunks. Um, and it is structured as a series of five mini essays or chapters, each of them devoted to a separate topic, such as radiation, um, or um, yeah, I'm trying to find one page which is missing here. Wait one sec. <laughs> Where is my page 24? Uh, here it is. Good. So radiation, organochlorines, xenoestrogens, mammography, and chemo prevention drugs. So there's five separate chapters um, devoted to, to those topics. And the film, all, of course, harnesses the effective power of art um, including also layers of um, um, images of Matushka's photographic self-portraits. I don't know if you remember her. Um, and also a lot of other art, such as Melanie Winter's War Memorial, which you may remember, mm -hmm. an installation of pink plaster torsos, which are arranged like grapes on the grass lawn. Um, and of course, you know, Dr. Susan Love is one of the experts um, talking about um, those topics. Uh, but the most important asset is, of course, Olivia um, Newton-John, who, whose own camera presence and voiceover uh, give shape to the loose form of the documentary and provides a celebrity factor mm. and, of course, injects human warmth to the point of identification by sharing her story of breast cancer. So in the final frames, she actually models uh, for the viewers an ideal breast cancer survivor, who is beautiful, rich, and white, um, <laughs> whose intimacy seeps into institutional context uh, when she testifies during the 1997 Senate hearing on cancer in Washington, D.C. And the film was made in 1999, so this is still you know, part of her 
the extension of her activism. Uh, and the soundtrack plays Save Me by Jackie Richardson. So this is a very powerful, you know, effective uh, cocktail. Throughout the film, we also hear Olivia Newton-John pose uh, rhetorical questions, what shall we do now, um, or sing her own songs with pointed lines like, I have to do what's right, I can't be quiet anymore. Uh, so such accentuating strategies add an overly didactic tone mm -hmm. uh, to the documentary's already omniscient voice, which is the voice of science. In Pink Ribbon, uh, Inc., we find a slightly different um, approach. This is a dynamic compilation footage, including a lineup of engaging speakers, including Dr. Susan Love, but also people like Barbara Ehrenreich, Barbara Brenner, um, recently passed, um, Dr. Olufunmi Layo Olopade, Samantha King, and of course Dr. Susan Love, who is in both documentaries. Uh, and there are interviews as well with um, Ambassador Nancy Brinker, uh, who is the CEO of the Susan G. Komen Foundation and Dr. Mark Hubert, Executive Director of the Avon Foundation. So we get those um, voices as well. There's also a rare interview with Charlotte Haley, uh, who made the original uh, salmon ribbon, right? So these interviews are framed by the extensive on-the-ground footage of um, Susan B. Komen Race for the Cure and the Avon Run for the Cure, to represent Vox Populi, so the voices of the people, which are interspersed with archival photographs, film clips, comic strips, uh, animation, and graphs. In addition to the balancing act of editing this gargantuan material, Lea Poole had to deal with the ethical challenges of interviewing a group of terminally ill women. Mm -hmm. So this is perhaps the most um, touching moving part of the documentary. They are introduced as stage, the stage four support group from Austin, Texas, and they provide a counterpoint hmm. to a lot of action that is happening around them in other frames of the documentary. Um, their fragile corporeality contrast with the robust physicality of the runners hmm. who constitute like the dominant frame for Pink Ribbons in. And these terminally ill subjects challenge society's prejudice against disease as death or failure. Mm -hmm. um, their vignettes deconstruct the mandated optimism and happiness, what Samantha King has labeled uh, mandatory, the tyranny of, of cheerfulness, and Barbara Aaron, mandatory um, <laughs> happiness, right? So they confront the illusion of life sanitized of illness, pain, and death, because they actually live that life. Um, so, Poole manipulates emotions and fact very skillfully, um, statistical facts about mortality rates and research spending elicit, as I said, strong emotions in the viewers, um, but there are still some issues with that kind of framing that um, I'd like to, to address. Um, since both Exposure and Pink Ribbons, Inc., as activist documentaries, rely on the use of personal testimony and on-screen interviews, they face multiple dilemmas related to the issue of legitimizing the views and opinions um, expressed on screen and constructing um, a distinct um, textual um, voice that can guide the viewers towards a preferred reading. Now, that concept of preferred reading uh, is Bill Nichols, who is a theorist of, of the documentary. Um, so you have a combination of different text layers and, and mixture of different textual voices. However, the montage, the um, emphasis, the um, screen time, the angle, everything combines to hint at the preferred reading. Mm. So the viewer usually has to be able to decode the preferred reading from, from the documentary. Now, what I'm saying is that in, the pink, in pink Ribbon, Inc., there might be, um, there might be a gap between you know, that tangle of voices and the possibility for the reader to arrive at some kind of preferred reading. Although, I mean, it depends. You can bring lots of different expectations and lots of different politics into watching this documentary. Um, so one major issue is that both documentaries use the authority of science to legitimize their claims about bodies and risks. And paradoxically, I would say that exposure 
um, fails to deconstruct the relationship between knowledge and power, um, situating itself on the side of science still, but it's this weaker, marginalized hmm. science or oppositional knowledge uh, that can contest mainstream approaches. However, it's still unquestionably relying on science to challenge dominant views. So there is this reverence for science which is still operating um, in exposure. And it's this expectation of um, better uses of knowledge that we need, basically, that you know the documentary is offering. Um, so in that sense, the film inscribes itself a little bit within the liberal paradigm, which is combined with potentially uh, radical elements. Um, and I would say that similar ambivalence haunts pink ribbons as well. Um, where multiple conflicting and even contradictory stories vie for the viewer's attention. And they hinder, and that, that, that you know, multiple presence, hinders any simple cognitive or effective um, resolution. Quite interestingly, Lea Poole, who's a very well-respected, well-known Quebec filmmaker, you may know her work, um, has been described by um, some critics as in a somewhat contradictory manner as a non-confrontational feminist filmmaker. Mm. Okay, so that part, non-confrontational and feminist, I would say, applies to uh, Pink Ribbons, Inc. as well. And for me, it problematizes it a little bit. So the film's potentially radical message can be safely contained through the framework applied to its understanding by the viewer and through the mode of its consumption, depending where you see it, with whom you see it. And a situation like that occurred uh, during a post-screening discussion at the 2012 Breast Fest, which I don't know if you've ever been to. I guess another one is coming up in March now, so in, I, I've just gotten the message about that. So the producer of Pink Ribbons, Ravida Din, was paired for balance in that post-screening debate um, with a cause marketing director of one of the Canadian banks. So, you know, he was given a hearing. He was given a chance to talk about the importance of doing this cause marketing and how it benefits society. Now, that balance pairing is highly problematic. Um, so this institutional festival setup um, shows the weaknesses of what our media uh, do nowadays, um, the egalitarian formula of streaming side by side formally and ideologically diverse representation, sort of like on an equal footing. And it's often decontextualized um, on the model of liberal pluralism, okay? Rather than pushing a radically mm. politicized um, agenda. So it's a strategy of containment of any potentially radical messages, right? So similarly, if you read uh, materials, um, for instance, because the Pink Ribbons, Inc. is actually a National Film Board production. Um, Deborah Drisdell, who is a marketing director for the National Film Board, uh, expressed concerns about the film's potential to offend, and I quote here, mm. those Canadians, including breast cancer survivors, who wear Pink Ribbons proudly, end quote, right? So indeed, it is difficult to view all the runners engaged in breast cancer fundraising as being duped and cleverly manipulated by organizers, right? Uh, but the unintended effect of juxtaposing voices in counterpoint, uh, in fact, diffuses the authority of any statements that are made. Um, and even though the film attempts to produce a preferred reading through skillful editing and montage um, that deliver a sense of emphasis and irony, Irony, unfortunately, is a rather unstable tool, as we know, right? And it can be easily missed by many viewers. So, you know, I put Nancy Brinker here because at the very end of the documentary, um, Nancy Brinker is allowed to make the final statement, and I quote here, until we have effective drugs, there is not enough pink. So... You know, I mean, and of course, this is in counterpoint to what other people like Barbara Brenner or Barbara Ehrenreich are saying. But that message can easily be latched onto by people in the audience, and it can be, it can resonate um, with authentic conviction for many viewers. So, you know, the interventionist work of the documentary may have been contained and diffused through this. Um, 
you can also say that perhaps there is a, still a difference between exposure which fixes meaning, which insists on having like uh, the answer of, and even by titling itself exposure, it sort of like signals that it's going um, uh, after its target and playing off truth against the lies, right? Uh, pink ribbons, though, you can say risks ambivalence, risks that the gap between different voices mm -hmm. will still be left um, to the viewer to, to interpret. So, I mean, I'm just looking at this. Two, that's what I wanted to tell you about those two documentaries. Um, but what is interesting to me is that they span that period between 1999 with Exposure and 2011 Pink Ribbons, Inc., um, which shows that transition, that shift towards more and more neoliberal mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. practice mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. cancer mm -hmm. activism, right? So there is an increasing level of acceptance by both professional and popular publics of those neoliberal dogmas of privatization, um, normalization, and what also can be referred to as geneticization of breast cancer, which that's where the bulk of the funding raised goes, right? So. Um, even though such documentaries aim to challenge biopower while availing itself of, of some of its vital practices, um, the question remains what kinds of publics and counterpublics they can raise, mm -hmm. right? And that is something that, you know, um, it's not so much a question of uh, particular viewers' responses to the documentaries, but more in terms of like opening up different kinds of relationality for, um, for larger publics. like what kinds of positions they allow the viewers to, t to assume. Um, how can the viewers relate to the cause of breast cancer through those documentaries? Um, what complex um, imbrications of the personal and the institutional they investigate. So again, where is this, um, you know, biopower, but the biopolitics of biopower, where it resonates with intimate force in the lives of people um, living with breast cancer? And also what kinds of language, what kinds of idioms they produce um, mm -hmm. to make understood, to make intelligible um, cancer activism to larger publics. Okay? So that's where um, I think we need to learn to read those representations more carefully and to understand um, that we're dealing today with an incredibly complex picture where, as I say, I mean, any site, any intimate site of a breast cancer diagnosis, um, treatment, um, and, and post-cancer life um, is already part of multiple larger fields. Um, how do we develop kind of language that we can understand those connections, those mm -hmm. very, very uh, important linkages so they don't escape us? Okay, thank you very much. Mm. I find that so interesting, Eva, when you were talking just sort of about the, the neoliberal containing dogmas, um, because you edited an issue of Canadian Women's Studies on cancer, women and cancer, yes. yeah, yes. With, which you co-edited, actually. I co-edited it. There were other people who um, were working with me, but mostly, I mean, I have to say this is like a kind of, shouldn't be, um, just one other cancer survivor. In, on the editorial board, who is a psychologist working at um, Toronto Western, mm -hmm. um, and she was mostly our advisor in terms of, you know, um, when we read the materials. Um, so she was sort of like a non-academic advisor, really. Mm. And then we had uh, Brenda Blondo, who is a colleague right, of mine yeah. from uh, the School of you Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Brenda Studies. Brenda was involved with WI Projects too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. uh, researcher working with trauma narratives. So right. she's got expertise in working with oral narratives of trauma survivors. Mm -hmm. And the third person is Lika, Lika Delacour, who helped us, uh, you know, read the materials. Um, and then the submissions came from, from a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. And um, there were situations where we actually selected uh, a piece and couldn't publish it because the person passed away. So um, there was no way mm -hmm. we to, could follow it through. to follow it through, yeah. and we didn't have contact with the family, and this would have been really hard, but it was a beautiful piece, mm -hmm. and I hoped it. We also had a piece by Rosalie Bertel, who plays such a prominent role in Exposure, you mm -hmm. may remember. Um, and this was 
it, we were very happy because this was one of the last pieces actually she passed away soon mm -hmm. after that. Um, the reason I brought it up actually was because I realized just in hearing your speaking now mm -hmm. is that part of what I was involved in at the time was reinvestigating a piece that I had done mm -hmm. and looking at how, um, how I need to push my own work in order to op be more open to radical possibilities. Mm -hmm. Just that idea of wanting to, to th that sort of insidious tyranny of being positive or being inoffensive yeah. in terms of your practice so that it can reach a larger audience and then mm -hmm. realizing, but what am I giving up by doing right. this? So I, this is part of what I'd done. It was a whole analysis of one of the pieces I had done. It was an online exhibition called Traveling and looking at the problematics of sort of getting seduced Right. by this sort of neoliberal language. Right. And so and I found that really interesting. Seduced by, yeah, by that culture of, you know, togetherness and optimism, but yes. also seduced by the trust in technology you know, mm -hmm. and medical research and absolute and faith that need, in that this yeah. is going to be the solution. That's the only solution. It's interesting, too, that you yeah. open with Rachel Carson. I don't know if people saw this recently. I think there was an article in McLean's um, specifically um, um, on Dom David Suzuki, and it was talking about his um, his own frustration in looking back at mm. not specifically cancer per se, but environmental issues and realizing right. that if anything we're further behind than we were and just feeling right. this sense of extreme frustration yeah. um, of not being able to realize. When you look at what, you know, you read Silent Spring again, which I just did, yes. and, and just the yes. language and thinking, oh my God, you know, it's like, where are we now? And how, how more complex it is to, right. because there are so many narratives and they've all been co-opted, mm -hmm. it's so difficult to dissect it. And it's, this is the problem also that I mentioned here that um, is so clearly visible, especially in those uh, pink ribbon fundraising, whatever, campaigns, that in fact, and that's a cliche, like you could say, um, that the public sphere has been shrinking for us to mm. have any form of like impactful yes, activism, absolutely. you know, because we can do those meetings, we can do those things, and we can dissect, we can deconstruct, but what's the impact of that? Mm -hmm. Those voices are not really percolating mm -hmm. into the public, yes. Um, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed both of yours. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm sitting here, and I think everyone um, probably has some reaction to some part of your presentation, mm -hmm. every day I click on the breast cancer site, right? Mm -hmm. And it is very enlightening to realize that you, this is all part of this neoliberal cause marketing thing, but you really feel like you're doing something. And I think a lot of people, even, you know, they want to believe that they're actually mm -hmm. doing something and not just, and I mean, I know it's very easy just to click on it. And it says this, your click will provide mammograms to many women, Yeah. right? So you feel like you're contributing, even if it's very mm -hmm. minuscule, mm -hmm. that you're contributing. So I think I really appreciate that you deconstructed some of this for us because you know, it's it doesn't it doesn't yeah, it's not something that most people are aware of. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. I can relate to it. I've struggled for mm -hmm. the past six years ever since my mom was diagnosed with mm -hmm. breast cancer to uh, figure it out. So I've had the ex my I've seen the experience you've had that mm -hmm. my mom went through and then the whole corporate world that I was involved with in the beginning because in the beginning, it was more of, to me, it's like, okay, I want to go make a difference. Like, you know, there's mm -hmm. something wrong in yes. my culture, there's something wrong in my community, but I need to figure out what it is. And to me, it was like, okay, I think the bigger charities will help me a lot more to first get out into the mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. than me just getting out alone. So I did join the CIBC room for the cure. If you ever need the binder to see what's in there, you can take it from Wonderful, me. yes. <laughs> I, did, I did quit that in between because of what I saw and what was happening. Um, it's mm. exactly what you said. You know, it's, you know, they don't, the feelings and the affect that people go through when they have breast cancer, it, it's not looked at, right? No. They, they, it's mm -hmm. totally no, it's, not it's looked this, at. So when I was yeah. in it, I jumped in and I said, okay, South Asians need to, you know, come out and learn more about cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And when I, I work in a bank, and when I went to them and I said, you know, do you want a sponsor? Then 
it, it was much easier to get a bigger sponsorship then than yeah. it is right now. Because mm -hmm. right now I'm local and I'm working with the community and I'm walking to different houses mm -hmm. and I'm trying to get people to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. It's because they're not getting their word, they're not getting their clients, it's their profit, mm -hmm. right? They give $5,000 mm -hmm. to them, their name goes on a big company and it goes nationwide, right? Yes. Whereas if it's a local thing, they're like, oh, you know, that's really so that's really interesting what you're yeah. saying, Preet. So you're saying, Preet, that you, the nature of your activism has changed, right? Yes, because in the beginning, what I, I was the run director for CFBC and for The Cure, you know, the things that did come to my head was, okay, so how are they paying for my hotel? Mm -hmm. How are they paying for three days of sitting here in a hotel, really not doing anything because you're at seminars, you're sleeping, and you know? And then flying out other people. So there's two run directors in every city in Canada. Mm -hmm. And from all the provinces, they flew everybody into downtown Toronto. And they're having these big seminars. They're having guest speakers. They're having people yeah. that went through cancer. And, you know, they're trying to get the emotional touch. And that's mm -hmm. what they're teaching mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. right? Oh, if you go on TV, this is what, like, you can go on uh, yeah. CBC News and you can find my interview where... You know, they wanted to see how my family was. And then, you know, they've used basically, to me now when I go back into it, my mom's emotions and mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. experience as a way to sell their run. Whereas mm -hmm. to me, that was just me trying to get people in at yeah. a big school, right? After that, I quit. You know, there was a whole lot of drama around there where I realized they really don't care about me, where it's just like, you know, Preet's not doing the work. That's it, blame her for everything. Mm -hmm. Went down and then I did my own organization where I wanted to fundraise. Again, made a mistake, we did it to Canadian Cancer Society, same thing again, same experience, money, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you're done. Now it's more towards where I came down to where I'm like, okay, let's just invest in a local thing, mm -hmm. find a program. Mm -hmm. And what I found was the local centers, I think psychological support, emotional support, mm -hmm. families. The real grassroots fun. stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I went down to the grassroots, but the way I do my work, or the way to get sponsorship is a lot harder now because they yes. question it. Yes. And it's like, where's it going? You're getting and it's also not as sexy. Yes, it's not because it's mm -hmm. not out there. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not in the face of, so what's this program going to do? There's more questions regarding that now than there were when mm -hmm. obviously these people knew you don't know where the money's going. Now I have a list of whatever I fundraise, I make sure they know every penny that goes into it and what's happening. Mm -hmm. So it's just really, yeah. it's a huge uh, mm -hmm. struggle. I mm -hmm. It'd be very interesting to uh, put you in touch with our two absent speakers, unfortunately. I mean, they mm -hmm. didn't, you know, couldn't be here. But because they, working in the, in the area of South Asian mm -hmm. uh, breast cancer awareness, mm -hmm, I understand. Mm -hmm. So that might be really useful for mm -hmm. you to connect and, you know, strengthen your ranks mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was also thinking of one other thing, and this is just, just thinking about my own discomfort. You know, mm -hmm. I always have people that are coming up to me and say, oh, I'm running for the cure tomorrow. Mm, I know. You know, as if they're running for me. And you know, and <laughs> you know, I you know, and I'm supposed to be really excited about this, and, and I feel so uncomfortable. I just feel so uncomfortable. I feel angry, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah. I try and sort of live in that ambivalent space myself, and and you know, and then I say, you know, I don't feel comfortable about this, and I know they mean well, and I know yes. this is coming from a caring place, and that this is very important for them, they get their pink t-shirts on, and they're out there, and yeah. you know, in the Prince Edward Memorial parking lot, running around around the circle, but um, it's, it's just that, that there are just so many questions unanswered, and I think, even when you were talking about just that sort of tyranny of positivism that drives me stark raving mad. I know. And I remember when I was going through cancer treatment, there was a woman, we used to have to go to these mindfulness meditation classes, right? Which I was convinced were a way of calming us down. And, <laughs> you know, so that we wouldn't get angry. And I remember this other woman who actually is dead now. She, um, she was just a real character who was, uh, had stage four breast cancer. And they wouldn't give her a reconstruction. I, I don't have a reconstruction. This is actually, a, I just started wearing a prosthesis Ooh. recently mm -hmm. because my back was getting bad. But anyway, she, um, she wanted a reconstruction, but they wouldn't give it to her because she had stage four cancer. 
Um, but anyway, the two of us used to raise hell in these mindfulness meditation. And we'd laugh. We'd come in with, you know, Mickey's of pie in our pockets. And there was another woman who would arrive, and she refused. She was going through really intense chemotherapy, so great huge patches of her hair was mm -hmm. falling out. Mm -hmm. And she refused to shave, and she refused to cover it. So her whole point is to show up at these sort of positive, you know, fun, you know, like we're all getting these cancer patients together and look at, we can look good and feel better. And she resisted it. And I was thinking when you're talking about grassroots, is that one person who walks in and refuses to shave, refuses to cover up, that refuses to put makeup on, that you can actually see how this disease is ravaging her face mm -hmm. had a phenomenal, and it really upset the organizers. See, the thing is, like, for my mom, it's a little different. Like, mm -hmm. the way I saw her, she didn't shave, mm -hmm. right? It was just bits of her hair falling out, and then yeah. whatever was bothering her, she would cut it. But she didn't walk into, so this is an organization yeah. called Wellspring. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, Wellspring. I know. Yes. 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 Where well, they're so patronizing. Yeah. So, <laughs> the one in Brampton, I have a really close eye on them because mm. I know the founder. So I always go in and I make sure they better be running properly. And so I tend to go in and talk to all the cancer patients that are tanned and mm. things like that. Because in the beginning, I had sent, like, okay, so my mom didn't want to leave the house. That's the problem, right? Like, in the beginning. You know, she would cover her head, people would come over. Well, because you get gawked at. Yeah, and she would feel embarrassed. But the thing with my mom also was that right after her surgery, her nephew passed away, which oh. she raised until he was 15. Right. right? So it was, my mother had two things to deal with. Mm -hmm. And in an Indian culture, when somebody passes away, you have people coming to your house. Mm -hmm. There's That's such a pain there. in the ass because they'll sit there and then, so what happened? You know, explain to us what happened. How was he? Oh, and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, like leave her alone. She's going through cancer. Mm -hmm. And then even with cancer, it's like, so what happened? You oh know, my, my God, neighbor, yes. Yeah. So my neighbor, yes. our neighbor's daughter had cancer and then her breast was leaking. Are you sure nothing's going to happen to you? So I was in grade 12 mm -hmm. and I would come home and my mom's crying on the phone and I'm sitting there going, the hell is she talking to? Like, I can't figure this out anymore. So then I eventually figured out it's like random family friends, friends calling and giving her stories of so and so and you know, and then my mom's like, we were a family that wasn't educated about it, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to learn as my mom's going through it. And like you said, the language you learn within those couple days, oh God, you yes, have yes. to make a decision, right? My mom didn't know what chemotherapy was. She has a language barrier mm -hmm. and that was still making a problem. My dad thought she was going to die. I thought she was going to die. But it's just, you know, it's very interesting when you're also presenting. You're also presenting because I'm sitting here going, I can relate, I can relate, I can relate. Well, then it's lovely yeah. to hear just the individual kind of experience that, that you know, when you're talking about complex linkages, yeah. even just within that microcosm <coughs> of your family, which are so unique, and, and immediately bring that whole reality forward. And I've met people where um, could probably relate, I don't know how I can relate to it, where um, we've had a client come in, because we do mortgages, and he wanted to remove his uh, wife from his mortgage. Uh, yeah. And then my dad asked, you know, why? Give me a reason for it. And he goes, she has breast cancer, she was just diagnosed with it, I don't want her on my house. And my dad looked at him and doesn't get out. <laughs> So you could go complain, I'm not dealing with this. It's like, she needs your support, what are you doing? I was denied insurance on a mortgage. Yeah. Because I have breast cancer. Yeah. So, so, so we had. No, yeah. I, I actually yeah. own a house with my soon-to-be ex-husband, mm -hmm. and uh, my his new, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, which has a huge wacky mortgage on it because I needed to actually borrow my contribution to get mm -hmm. through my cancer treatments, mm -hmm. um, and so at one point we had to refinance the house. Mm -hmm. And at that point, because I had been diagnosed with cancer three weeks after the house was purchased, purchased. I was then denied, so I will not. I'm not able to get a mortgage mm -hmm. now because I have had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's hard enough for women anyway. Yeah. But you add on to that language barriers, culture barriers, and then terminal illness. My mom can't get like. And you can't. No, she, there's no way she could get it. No. Right. 
So it's just interesting. And Pam, and I was just going to say, not that it's relevant, but even after you're declared cancer free, like you moved after no, five years, no. never again. Your life is so. My fiance's best friend is one of those people who decides on the risk whether to give you insurance or not. They think you're going to die. Yeah, so I've had a fight with uh, him over this. Is there a way of erasing that from your record after, I don't know, no. 10 years? No. Or? No. no. There's no way once you have... Not like a car accident. No. <laughs> 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 it's not a deal. It's your body. If, yeah. if you've been diagnosed three weeks after, from the way I know our insurance... Oh, it was when we had to refinance. Oh, it's uh, when refinance. you had to refinance, you can't get it. I couldn't get I it. before, like, yeah. if it was three weeks after, you I was still covered, yeah, but then because we had to refine it. Yeah, refine it, yeah. Yes. It's funny, things people don't know about, because people, when I say about cancer cost, too, um, you know, if you're not coming from an upper middle class, yeah. white family, where there's an awful, you know, there's good private health insurance, people mm -hmm. say to me, well, what's your problem? And I said, well, I'm a, I was a single parent, and I didn't have ex good extended health care coverage. Um, who's going to look after my kid? Who's going to feed me? If I'm not working, there's nobody else that's supporting me. I mean, there's horrendous horror stories of what yes. people have to deal with. And yeah. there's an assumption. There's that kind of, when you think about the neoliberal way of viewing things, there's just this assumption that our society is looking after right. us. And then you get those poster cancer, breast cancer patients like Libby Snymer or oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Marla Shapiro. <laughs> yeah. Sort of like become our public now voices. Now you're getting me angry. <laughs> become our public voices of breast yes, cancer, I know, right? I mean, yeah. having their individual columns in the, in the Globe yeah. and Mail, in, in the Post, whatever. And that's the experience that you see through, through their you know, own lens. I just want to add, um, which is something that you mentioned in there, is how um, all these campaigns keep referring back to science. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, that's, yeah, that was the other piece um, I was thinking of. And my partner letter. is um, a scientist, and he speaks a lot. He's not specifically dealing with cancer, but just the politicization of mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. Who gets funded? Yes. And the oh. government and whoever's in power sort of directs that, you know, and um, yeah. who gets funding for their research is dependent on what they're saying in their research. There's certain kinds of research that does not get funded. Absolutely. Yeah. And that directs what what the science is that says. And science is such it's such an overwhelming generalized term. Yes. But it doesn't just like with breast cancer, the breast cancer survivor, all those terms, you know, you sort of assume you know what they mean. Mm. Yes. Mm. But the same thing with science, you know, it's like a Absolutely. certain science that is they getting also, They science. also like to tell you that any type of science can be published. Yes. Uh, as an academic, that all types of science within this field can be published, but it's quite obvious after years and years of asking for multiple grants within this realm that this is not no. what you're looking for. No. And you have to use their terminology and their language to, and then somehow squeeze your own perspective in, maybe without them even re realizing Exactly. To, to yeah. really get any of that funding. So it's like this recursive loop, really, you know. I mean, you're reproducing the same, the same reproducing the same. And like anyone who's ever applied for grants knows, right, that you, the genetics is in your grant has to be framed in terms of what's currently being funded. Yes, yeah, yes. I just wanted to um, point out that uh, and ask you mm. to which extent is this a typically North American phenomenon? Mm. Because Good in question. Europe, mm -hmm. where I'm from, I'm from Switzerland, mm -hmm. and we have a basic coverage universal health care which is not free but mandatory mm -hmm. and if you cannot pay for it the state will subsidize but most people pay for it and it would not occur to me that I would be doing anything supporting people who had bre breast cancer. So my great grandmother had breast cancer, my grandmother had breast cancer and I would not have the idea of buying a pink KitchenAid uh, to, uh, domestic appliance to support breast cancer. We don't have, I, I think, I think we don't have like who runs like. Mm -hmm. running, I don't think we have Interesting, that. Interesting. Yeah. And to to which extent is this related to one neoliberal economies and to the lack of a healthcare system which covers all the costs, mm -hmm. not just the cancer costs, but the the cost on your family. Mm -hmm. And we had in in Switzerland, in Lausanne, a program um, in in a university hospital that looked not at pa uh, cancer patient, but at the spouses of cancer oh, patients. Interesting. Like mm -hmm. a program for spouses. So they really care about treating that as a whole family. And they notice the divorce rate is, of course, going up when you, well, that's something difficult to deal with in, in couples. So I wondered 
how far this is linked to a North American culture of war and fight. Mm -hmm. I never, I was mm -hmm. shocked when I first arrived in Canada to see all these ads in the subway, like get mm -hmm. screen, get mm -hmm. screen. I got like a personal reminder, though I never gave that information out, but um, by my healthcare provider here that I should be screened for cervical cancer. Like, <coughs> I personal letter that I could get that for free. I mean, right. I never get that in Switzerland. If, if I go to my doctor, he or she will remind me that I can get that, but I don't like get a, a letter. So how is this rhetoric of war and fight coming from? Is it linked to mm -hmm. the war on terror or the war on something else? It's yeah. much older than that. It's much older than mm -hmm. that. And actually, Pink Ribbon sort of like, if you have a chance to view this, um, have a look. It explains, it takes you back to, um, you know, the origin of cancer societies here in North America. But what you talk is very interesting, and thank you for, mm -hmm. for this comment. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I mean, there is this expansionism of this kind of breast cancer um, culture that you even see in pink ribbons again, like yeah. they've taken it to, um, you know, the, the United, uh, to, to Egypt, for instance, or you have yeah. uh, pink pyramids, you know, at one point. Um, what you're saying is quite interesting, and I don't know if there's like a simple causal thing that there's this culture of, you know, belligerency, war, yeah. aggression, or whatever. It has to do, I mean, I, I have some background in, uh, I mean, I come from Poland originally, and I haven't lived there for a very long time, however, I've been talking to people there. And it has a lot to do also with public invisibility of many things, and with yeah. completely mm. different, you mm -hmm. know. So it's not necessarily um, so good mm -hmm. that you won't see it in public places right. because your doctor may or may not remind you about certain things, you yeah. know, unless you totally trust your doctor. In terms of what is available for people already diagnosed, and again, Poland happens to be the place which has, um, what, what, what happened, because cancer, breast cancer, not only breast cancer, but cancer generally is very, is diagnosed very late there because there's mm -hmm. no screening, and this is, mm -hmm. this is a casualty of a move away from socialized healthcare toward, yeah. toward you know, um, new privatized, pri privatized health. There's a two-tier system, clearly. Yeah. But um, all over Europe, they still use the same protocols. So no matter whether it's visible or invisible, whether you happen to be, you know, once you get into the system, this, this seems to be like the same kind of, um, you know, protocol that is applied to, to treating uh, cancer. So you, you won't escape that. Yeah. And it's really difficult to negotiate that. It is. Unless you go to a smaller right. hospital. I remember my right. cousin did that. But when I went into, for example, when I went into Princess Margaret, this was what I was offered for chemo and there was nothing else. Nothing yeah. else, yes. And this was non-negotiable. And if you, you had staples on your chest, even though you wanted stitches, forget it. I asked for a sentinel node biopsy. Sorry, it would take too much time. Yeah. You know, there was a very fixed <coughs> protocol. They're in there to make money. Uh, I think, I think the, the no, you don't pay. You can't pay in this system, really, unless you pay. You, you, you go, can to, go the to the states. states. Exactly. Yeah. You go to the yeah, states you and you the pay. States and pay. But if you opt yeah. out of any of that, you are a difficult patient. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the level of your care immediately goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you there may are taking a serious risk. There are smaller yeah. hospitals where you can get perhaps more personalized care, but yeah. ultimately there is this protocol that the government will cover. Um, and I think that is is very limiting mm -hmm. as well. And I think that also tends to promote a certain kind of culture mm -hmm. um, as well. There was right. something else, but it went out of my head. Yes, yeah. Alina. I wondered if there was um, any, uh, first of all, are the protocols based on this EBM, this evidence-based medicine that then- It's all based on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that they've moved to. Right. And secondly, how, what, how difficult is it to uncover the connections between, for instance, my interest is bariatric surgery, mm -hmm. and there's a very clear public record of, at some point, what's not clear is when the government decided they wanted to have mm -hmm. it, that such a program in place. But what is clear is who started mm -hmm. uh, um, petitioning the government for control of that, mm -hmm. and who wanted to be part of that, because it's mm -hmm. part of parliamentary records. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, because the bariatric surgeons and the regular surgeons groups, associations, decided to post their minutes for some sort of meeting they had about deciding how they would promote post-bariatric surgery to the government to be covered. So mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. in those ways, it's clear, right? So it's like, well, why would mm -hmm. you post that? But anyway, how, how can you uncover those connections? Because here in... Obviously, there's more going on in the background, right? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not just the science and what's available. I mean, 
I think it's always in contention, even within scientific circles, mm -hmm. that some scientists want to, like the guy who discovered the HPV was a virus, mm -hmm. right? He fought that and fought that and fought that, and they were like, you're a crank. For the longest time, they dismissed his theory, right? He's like, no, it's true, it's true. And now we have a, we have a, a shot. Mm -hmm. But, um, so it, uh, how do you research that, though? I mean, this is also clandestine, right? Like, it's all, <laughs> yeah. it seems like, it, but to say it, it almost sounds like you're a conspiracy theorist, yes. right? <clears throat> like, you can't say, well, I know that they're back to, in the background, they're talking about things, and it's the move, like, but how do you discover that? Oh, can I just mention one thing? This is an offside. Um, Rick Blickstead just resigned, just retired, right, from the Wellesley Institute. Okay. which has been a very sort of proactive place in, in moving, especially around sort of community-based work. But he was saying, at one point I had a meeting with him, this was about, um, he was going to work with WI projects and at, at one point, and um, he said, you know, people are really getting tired about, like, whether there's going to be a cure or not. It's like there's this constantly, like, <laughs> fund the cure, run for the cure, all this <laughs> stuff, and he said, Enough's enough with this, okay? I'm sure there's a cure out there somewhere. But just talking about your conspiracy theories, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. He said, I'm sure there's a cure there somewhere, but people just don't, I mean, it would just totally screw everything up if there actually was a cure because hundreds of thousands of people would be out of jobs. Yeah. So it's just, it's just this, you know, the way things get manipulated so that people keep their jobs. And look at, I mean, look at those beautiful offices they have at Princess Margaret. I mean, yeah. you know, These are private endowments, all of it, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Anyway, I was. But they, they all have their names on them. Those you, you walk into it's any so medical facility, you walk into a lovely, you know, Koffler Center or whatever. Every every floor has a name now in those hospitals. Yeah. yeah. At my hospital near my house is the Colonel Sanders Wing. <laughs> oh my God! I am not lying. It's the, it's at Queensway and Toronto. Yeah. Colonel Sanders Wing. Do they have this in Switzerland as well? Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting because it's you funding, because you brought up this whole question of you know government the difference between government support. It's also, uh, and, yeah. in universities, it's from the found that uh, companies like Nestle or whichever uh, would found like chairs like mm -hmm. university chairs. They right. might sometimes found buildings like the Rolex Learning Center. Oh my god! Oh yeah, the Rolex <laughs> Learning Center. <laughs> What am I learning? Like fun chairs in any discipline. Usually. Yeah. So it's yeah. like another uh, relationship to the comfort world in general because it's okay. It is neoliberal. It is consumerist, but it is not to the same extent as North America. Mm. Yes, and we can't name any wing here. The Rachel Carson wing, for instance, right? Because that's to honor people whom we want to honor now. Mm -hmm. We can't. Oh, medication yeah. has really annoyed me. <laughs> so oh God, one yes. Of those where I wanted to just go and grab her doctor and be like, "What are you doing to my mom?" Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I couldn't afford any of it. Yeah. I opted out because I, they wanted to put me on an aromatase it's, inhibitor, three thousand dollars a month. Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's I can't cheap, afford that. Generic, so generic I version now. Yeah. That's that cheaper now. God, I forgot which one it was. Um, the doctor didn't tell her at first. It was a pharmaceutical company. When she went. And when my dad went over and he's like, you know, there's a shot that can build her cells up faster after her chemo, you can try getting it. And my dad's like, okay, this is when my dad was trying to figure out his job and we were in that scenario of struggling because he mm -hmm. had a mom looking mm -hmm. over. And it turns out we would have to pay for it. Oh, yeah. You're right? talking about new last step probably. I or, think yeah. so. And, you know, and then there's like a nurse that would come over. And you have to go pick it up from the drugstore and then, and then bring it in. And then they, it, yeah, Lena saved my life once. I had to go in for surgery. And they said, oh, we have to give you this injection. Mm -hmm. And, I, and they, so they write out the prescription. And then it was $345. I didn't have $345, so Lena went over to the drugstore and got it and brought yeah, it back. And, and they injected me with this horrible thing. It was a $3,000. That one was $3,000 or $2,000. Yeah, $3,000. And my dad's like, you know what, just get it. I'll eventually figure it out. And even the nurses, like, I think it was after 24 That's insane. hours you had to yeah. come and inject it. And she calls me like eight hours after her chemo. But I'm coming over now because I don't have time later. This is a government nurse. And I'm looking at her going, no, you're not touching my mother until another 24 hours. Don't you dare enter my house. Mm -hmm. I'm changing this, right? That was one. And then my mother's, uh, one of the person I'm researching. Can I call you if I go through a yeah, recurrence? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can all you want. I've had those wars with my family doctor. And one of the ladies I'm researching, and I'm interviewing for my research for Eva's class, uh, she was 
like you said, an option where you're not really given an option when it comes mm -hmm. to treatment. What they told her was, you're at your last stage. We touch you or we do a surgery. You're just going to die. Right? Yeah. Or you can just live for two to three months and, you know, you're good to go. And she just chose the path to have the surgery. And she lived. Mm -hmm. So I'm just looking at her and I just, you know, I'm just like, how would you, like, what if, like, it was just an option yeah. where they scared her off and said, mm -hmm. no. Is she oh, absolutely. And no, she was like 40 something. Okay. Part of yeah. It's surprising. They, they tried to do more, that to me. They're usually more aggressive with younger women, but with the elderly, they would try yeah, to and they're just like, you know, <coughs> be more conservative. They you and you'll just die. <coughs> so what do you want to do? Do you want to just live for two to three months or die right away? She's like, either way, I'm dying. Just all three. Right. Get now she's surviving and she has lifetime of chemo to go through once a month. And I just think it's just the whole process of the doc like the doctor changed medication on my right. mom and then I went back and yelled at him again and you know, cause she's like, I think it's just crazy. And it I is. think this culture itself makes it hard too, because like you're saying, mm -hmm. it's like when it comes to corporate world, to me it personally hurt me because I actually went in and I have the internal experience mm -hmm. of where mm -hmm. it goes, what's happening with mm -hmm. it. People don't listen. Like I've had doors shut in my face and I've had my dad being told, you know, what do I look like? I'm a man. I'm not going to have breast cancer. And my dad's like standing here going, well, you also have a wife. Don't forget mm -hmm. that. And men do get breast cancer. Yeah, they do. And, yeah. Yeah. and you know, there was a counselor. This is funny. So one, at one of my events, this is a city counselor. And his son actually ended up telling me this. And he's like, my dad thinks men can't have breast cancer. And I, this is like in front of thousands of people. And I have the mic. And I'm like, so, Mr. Dillon, since you're the city counselor, <laughs> can men be diagnosed with breast cancer? He looks at me and he's like, no. And I'm like, OK, let me just re-educate. You're a city councilor. Men can have breast cancer. What are you doing here without reading anything? So it's just it's been tough. I think I think too it's it's that continual frustration, you know, and as you're talking, you know, with more and more of this sort of um, these kinds of things like the pink ribbon campaign, mm. which men, you know, when I think back to Carson's time, <coughs> there wasn't this kind of sort of no. general um, acceptable ways, comfortable ways of, Who of is doing it. Accessible it? To, right? No, yeah. yeah. No, but this is this is also yeah. Who is it accessible to? Right. It's also a huge paradox, though. I mean, that's the that's the problem. This yeah. is exactly the challenge that we are facing. I think because yeah. when you look at the history of breast cancer, um, whatever cultures you could call them, mm -hmm. the last forty years, really, in the seventies, this was shrouded in silence, mm -hmm. secrecy, taboo, mm -hmm. and you needed people like in North America again. You needed people like you know um, the president's wife, who publicly came out as came out quote unquote as someone who had breast cancer, and then slowly you know memoirs started to appear and mm -hmm. so on. So forty years to move from taboo and secrecy and silence towards this kind of public you know. Ra ra spoon Exactly, <laughs> but Indian culture is <clears throat> yes, you're, you're right. Immigrant cultures and, and certain, you know. And even more in Canada. But so what I see as a paradox is that, in fact, we know as little as we did for years. Oh yes, years ago. and in fact, it becomes Despite more and more challenging. Exactly, yeah. exactly with the, with what you were saying. And also because of yeah. the illusion that everything is out in the public now, yes. you know, because yeah. nothing it's is not. out in the public, no. and it's more and more secretive way of actually, like what uh, Alida said here about this almost conspiracy theory, where to find it, how to understand why. Um, for 40 years, people haven't invented a less painful mammogram machine, for instance. They have. They have. But it's never been given a patent to be allowed to be used in hospitals because the companies that have already set up the entire production line for mammograms wouldn't let it happen because they are government lobbies. Mm. And when they did, they started, they themselves invested in digital mammograms, which had recently come, like, you know, they recently came into our um, hospitals, right? Uh, but even then, the process was very slow because they had to wait till the old mammogram machines were kind of like used enough. <laughs> and then they introduced digital mammograms. So this is now the, and what they did with the old mammogram machines, they sent them to, yeah, they sent them to other countries where they, people maybe didn't even have a problem with breast cancer, but now they're going to have horrible old mammogram machines and they will be screening new populations for breast cancer and generating new profits through that, of course, you know. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is, you need some good investigators. And mammograms become the standard of care, which we know in, 90, in many <coughs> percent, and in my case, was totally ineffectual. They Not only ineffectual, but I would say they still harmful. They still, yeah. you know, ionizing radiation. So, mm-hmm. cumulative effects of ionizing radiation. Mm-hmm. Nobody's talking about it except for some, you know, investigative sites, blogs, whatever, where people are uh, squeaking that, you know, this is a little, little <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because uh, some women in France are trying to resist mammogram or question systematic mm-hmm. mammogram. Mm, That's yeah. the current which is uh, <coughs> coming up. And another question I have for you: Did you look uh, at research on breastfeeding? The, the relationship oh, yeah. between yeah. women and doctors and science and society. That's yeah. Yeah. interesting. <coughs> and the connections mm-hmm. between the erotic breast, the breast which can be destroyed by breast cancer mm. and the nurturing breast or breastfeeding yeah. and how this may or may not appear in public and the way this is shaped by, by a normative authoritative knowledge. So have you looked at this? Uh, did you see any connection in this uh, breastfeeding research on breastfeeding and research on breast cancer? On breast cancer. <coughs> the attitude towards me. women patients or women <coughs> not knowing what they should do for themselves? And I mean, the, the, sorry, I think I'm losing my voice. Here, so I don't know if I can. <coughs> There's a huge amount of literature around those sort of interrelationships. I mean, I yeah. always find it. Sorry, I, need to get some, I, I always find it water. hilarious, you know, because I, I remember Cynthia Grant and I um, used to both had babies, and we used to go to restaurants and breastfeed and be asked to leave a lot. My cousin Julia um, was part of um, the La Leche League yeah, yeah. here in yes. Canada as well. Yeah. And it's sort of ironic that we both ended up with breast cancer. But just that whole, there's, yeah, there's been so much literature yes. done around the relationship of breast and... You can also yeah. even link the, I mean, this on the one hand, uh, huge sexualization, right? Yeah. Of breast as yeah, a sexual yeah. organ. <clears throat> but if you think in the context of breast cancer, uh, the issue of breast reconstruction that is being pushed, you know. Oh, I mean, big this time. Is, yes. And I've that. actually been in a situation where I was sitting at a pool um, <coughs> and I heard three women at the other end of the room. I don't think they were aware that I was... And at the time, um, I didn't wear a prosthesis for years. I didn't start wearing one until very recently. And it was three women who actually sat and ridiculed me. They didn't know really? I could... Yeah, it was just... just So that kind of yeah. push, you know, that, like, you know, my cousin went through 21 surgeries to have her breasts yeah. reconstructed. Yeah. I just refuse to do that because I'm high risk for surgery. I don't see the need to have unwarranted surgery. But it was it's just that kind of discourse that forces you into the you know like why didn't she do that? Isn't that disgusting? You know, why would someone choose not to do it? You can per- mm-hmm. my sister had it done, you know, when she had of course in those days when when we had ours right. um you couldn't have reconstruction at the same time. Right. And the the, yeah. uh, the connection also between, you know, discourses around breastfeeding and breast yes, cancer which yeah. is totally unexpected as well is the issue of uh, environmental toxins yeah. you yeah. Know, in the yeah. breast. Uh, they cause cancer, they also poison breast milk. So there is now scientific discourse um, about the harmfulness of um, Mm -hmm. breastfeeding, really. And it, for me, goes back to Nana and the work with Zola, Mm -hmm. where it's all within the body of women. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's the body of women that are destroying, you know, that we then become poisoned bodies who then are responsible for the dissolution of a yeah. society. What I would like to self responsibility is that I'm studying natural moms, so, so natural parenting, mm-hmm. technology, mm-hmm. environmentalism, and religion. And there's this discourse that surfaces again and again that breastfeeding decreases the risk of breastfeeding. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. Again and, again. and that's taken up by these, these natural moms, by La Leche, by yeah, 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 all yeah, these yeah. pro breastfeeding yeah. organizations yes. that say if you breastfeed, they don't see it that way, but by some of these women who maybe are less educated, they think, I'm guaranteed not to have breast cancer because I breastfed, like, right. I extended breastfeeding, right. whatever. Oh. So what do you think of these, these connections? It's kind of... Well, this is totally, amazing. totally, you know, <laughs> unsupported. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yours archive actually has stuff on uh, the myths and everything. When I went to mm-hmm. Surrey, Around, and yeah, they breast have an entire collection oh. on uh, How interesting. Breast, can- uh, breast Mm-hmm. Reading it, like to me, it felt like it was just a way to control women. Yeah. Yes, and absolutely. They kind of yeah. them to nurture their children. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of myths, exactly what you said. If you breastfeed, you won't have breast cancer. Mm-hmm. And the news articles that were in there, 
That's exactly what they said. Yeah. And yet the irony is I know of two women who were both diagnosed with breast cancer immediately following or just before the birth of their children. Yeah. Um, because the huge bed. amount of change in mm -hmm. hormones that mm -hmm. can actually exacerbate the cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's actually can be the opposite. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I just want to go back to this uh, environmental issue, you know, I mean, uh, th there is this contradictory discourse around benefits that are outweighing mm -hmm. the harms, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But for some women, and the problem is that nobody actually ever tests this milk for, you know, how much mm -hmm. toxicity mm -hmm. is there. Mm -hmm. And I think that for many women living in particularly compromised industrial areas, right, it might be a very, very serious problem, you know, that breast milk is seriously contaminated in, in some areas. Um, so, but that's this interesting connection there. Um, and, oh, talking about myths around breast cancer, mm -hmm. um, and this is, of course, guilt-inducing mm -hmm. uh, abortion. Oh, yeah, that's that's another link that has been, yeah. you know, um, highlighted. I, I think I think what you're talking about this whole idea of guilt inducing yeah. Yeah. you know this ability to con continue to control women and this whole yeah. idea of, of increasing guilt you know oh my god there's something wrong with you because of course that whole discourse shifts yeah. you know I think of the 50s where it was not considered good to breastfeed mm -hmm. you were expected to be bottle feeding your children mm -hmm. that, was, mm -hmm. that was started by the pablo industry yeah, yeah. so yeah. you know it's, it's you really have to begin to think about it Shall we wrap? Shall we wrap up? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for this really, Thank you for coming. really interesting. I always forget that this is one of the few places that, regardless of how many people show up, there's all this really, really interesting discussion. I am very grateful to OISE and specifically the Center for Women's Studies because of that. Yeah. So, yeah. for especially for emerging scholars, for those of you who are doing your research now, you know. We welcome you to come and present here because right. um, you really do get some amazing feedback from other scholars. So thank you. We thank you very much for your contributions as thank well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.